Welcome, everybody, and uh, thank you very much to the, for coming to the first uh, DIFF Hospitality and Travel SIG webinar. This is webinar 01. Um, on uh, and around the subject of uh, self-sovereign identity, uh, decentralized digital identity technologies, and very specifically the opportunities because of those uh, for hospitality and travel. So I've got a quite a full deck here. I'm going to take uh, most of the hour, I think. Um, if there are any questions, please do put them in the chat. We'll try and respond to them in the chat now. If we run out of time today, we will respond um, and can respond tomorrow even on our, our regular weekly SIG call. Um, but there will be future webinars. Uh, the next one is on the 1st of September. Uh, and we will respond to questions that uh, we haven't had a chance to uh, address uh, no later than the 1st of September. So let me, uh, let me start. And I want to start by uh, answering a question that sounds simple, but perhaps isn't. And that is, what is digital identity? A digital identity is the collection of data that represents a unique person or entity online. Now that entity may be a person, it may be an organization, or it can be a thing such as an app or a device. Digital identity uh, is therefore a collection of rich data, which to be useful needs to be first represented by a digital identifier to identify the subject of the uh, identity and then trusted by the receiving party. So let's take a quick look at the digital identifiers currently in use in the hospitality context. And I'm going to use hospitality today, but it's interchangeable really for, for any other uh, industry within the hospitality uh, and travel uh, spectrum. Uh, and we'll, we'll look at these identifiers used in the hospitality context and the digital identities behind them. And we start with a simple mental, mental model uh, showing our relationship to our customer. We would like to believe that we know our customer or at least the most loyal and frequent of them. And this model clearly implies this intimacy. But the structure of our industry and the considerable presence of travel intermediaries makes it difficult for travel providers to have good visibility of the arriving customer. Add to this the widespread use of easy and simple to use federated identity mechanisms provided by large social media and search companies, which very clearly benefit financially from the provision of this so-called free service and travel providers are further distanced from the arriving customer. And somewhat uh, jokingly I said, is Facebook cyberpunk really my customer? But it is really not too far um, off that. And when the arriving customer walks through the door to our hotels, the customer reasonably expects that we will know them. But there are two problems. A single customer has multiple identifiers, can have multiple identifiers, most probably does have many identifiers, and none of the identities behind those commonly used identifiers can store and present the digital data that we need, passport, loyalty number, and payment methods, for example. And this is why, in part, travel intermediaries exist as a proxy for the digital identity and profile of the arriving customer. And they do store just enough profile information, name, address, payment, for example, to be convenient for the customer, which is just enough convenience to keep the customer coming back each time because convenience is, in effect, a digital drug. Travel intermediaries are therefore identity controllers and providers, and they use that identity and the convenience it provides to the customer to control the sales funnel. And it's not as though hotel direct sites work much better. Hotels use the same federated identity models plus a loyalty ID, but do this only for a small percentage of customers. Most of the arriving customers remain anonymous as they travel through the sales funnel, even though they might want the receiving hotel to know who they are. And with every year, as more of our business is transacted online, possibly all of our business, the customer is increasingly obscured from view. 
And this, and this is important, is not a model that works well for the travel provider, but it also doesn't work well for the customer. Travel providers need a better identity toolkit with which to compete, one that in, affords a much better visibility of the customer. Such a possibility has been unavailable until now. And this is the opportunity for self-sovereign identity and decentralized technologies that enable SSI for hospitality and travel. So what are we looking at here? It's an identity referenced by a single identifier that is self-owned for life. Referring to a rich store of information that the individual wishes to create and share or receive and use. This information that we might call a profile can include many things such as static information, name, address, preferences, credentials. It can include payment methods. It can include passport and driver's licenses, loyalty cards, boarding passes, hotel mobile keys, rental car keys, travel and health passes. Much of this information is represented by things we call verifiable credentials and claims. A driver's license is a verifiable credential. So is a pay payment method, for example. A claim that you might wish to make is that you are old enough to qualify for a senior citizen discount or that there is enough money in your bank account to pay for something. These things we call zero knowledge proofs. The important thing about both verifiable credentials and ZKPs is that the receiver is not required to contact the issuer to verify them. There's no phone home needed. The decentralized public key infrastructure is the mechanism that provides proof sufficient to enable the required trust. And lastly, there is one profile for the individual and this profile and the associated storage contains much information that is not specific to hospitality and travel. And that's the way it should be. So you can think of the profile decomposing into personas that contain only the information relevant for a specific purpose. For example, a profile for hotel stays or one for air travel or one for medical. At least that's how we think this will work out. So where is this profile stored? And this is where we start talking about diff terminology. A profile is stored along with other information in a private data store owned and controlled by the identity subject and referenced by the subject's identifier. Importantly, one other thing to mention here, organizations can have identity too and can also store information about themselves. And as you will see shortly, they can engage in commerce using this identity. And one last thing before we move on, that little red verifiable credential in the bottom right corner of the customer profile, well, that's an offer received from one of these hotels against a shopping request issued by a digital agent that is controlled by this customer and that has access to the information in the customer profile. And all this works because there is cryptographically proven trust enabled between all these entities. Trusted identities presenting trusted information, customer to business, business to business. And even things can have an identity and be trusted. So before we move on, a quick summary. People, businesses, and things can have identity and can use this identity and trusted information associated with this identity to engage in commerce. So that's the groundwork. Now let's look at a high level view of the diff architecture. And here it is, and it doesn't look that familiar if you are arriving with a typical travel technology mental map. I'll explain the individual elements in more detail on the next slide. But now, the important points working from the bottom up. Here we see multiple decentralized systems, blockchains in this case, of different types, containing the public keys of the identities that they enable. Above that, a set of tools and diff components used to enable interactions between these identities. Now note, 
that the travel provider on the right hand side uses in abstract essentially the same components as the individual. And last point here, and this is a very important point. Everything that I've said up to this point leads to this. The interaction model enabled by the decentralized technologies and the trusted identities that they support, if it has not yet become obvious, is a peer-to-peer -peer interaction. Now, there are four principal DIF architectural components, and I'm going to go through them, some in more detail than others. And again, starting from the bottom up, uh, decentralized systems, we refer, refer to them as decentralized systems, but for the sake of this uh, talk, we're going to just refer to them essentially as blockchains today uh, or ledgers. And we'll talk about their here, the properties, they are decentralized by definition. They are immutable. When you write something to the chain, it is written. You can't unwrite it. They're chronological. They store and timestamp actions against uh, the record. And they can be public in the case of decentralized identity technologies. They need to be public. Moving on from that, the universal resolver, which we call a W3C universal resolver, uh, fulfills a similar purpose to the Berkeley Internet name domain in the DNS system, if you're familiar with that. And that is the resolution of identifiers. But instead of resolving domain names, the universal resolver resolves self-sovereign identifiers, which we call DIDs, and it retrieves against those identifiers associated information, such as service endpoints and cryptographic keys. And we find those in the thing we call the DID document. And we use these for communicating with the entity referenced by the DID, another person or a company, for example. The universal resolver performs these tasks to enable the basic building blocks of a self-sovereign identity world. Now, identity hub. This is something quite unfamiliar to a lot of people, but hopefully it will become fairly self-evident where it's necessary. This is a, a mesh of replicated off-chain personal data stores controlled by the owner of the DID, the subject, which allows storage of sensitive data, such as profile data, official documents, contact information, and much more. Offers, for example, that little red verifiable credential as an offer, that was stored in an identity hub. This data store is fronted by standardized APIs that you can think of, maybe collections, for example, different APIs for different types of data, profile information, and permissions. And importantly, the data model within the identity hub it does not have a fixed schema or a set of data to support. Instead, hubs follow a semantic data model in which each piece of data self-contains all the metadata necessary for interactions. And lastly, uh, the individual data elements uh, that are stored within the identity hub are, granted, are allowed to be shared through a granular control um, through permission grants. So you can get access to very specific things, for example, a passport ID rather than you don't need all of the information on the passport. That's really what that means. And lastly, the user agent. And um, the user agent, I think, will be familiar. It's really a digital wallet, but it's an identity wallet and today commonly found on a, uh, on a mobile device. Let's look a little bit more about the identity hub because this uh, concept uh, as discussed on the previous slide, is central to much of the work that the HNT SIG is currently undertaking. So it deserves a little bit more uh, examination. Without an identity hub or similar storage location for rich personal information, there would be little information beyond the identity itself and some simple verifiable credentials uh, to share and use. Now, I don't go around every day showing my passport and driving license to people for example, but I do describe myself, sometimes commercially, who I am, where I live, what I like or don't, how I can pay for purchases. All this is part of my digital life. And for those scenarios that add so much to the potential of a self-sovereign digital identity, we need a place to store information about ourselves and our lives. And in DIFF terminology, this space is called an identity hub. Now, uh, this is work in progress. It's early stage development of core technology. So it's rough around the edges. It's a mixture of competing ideas. Nevertheless, important work is now underway to bring this concept to light. Life. 
The work is being done in a joint DIF W3C work group called Secure Data Storage. Um, and I thought it might be useful to quickly review the work group charter so you can see what's happening. The work group charter says, uh, the work group exists to create one or more specifications to establish a foundational layer for secure data storage, including personal data, specifically data models for storage, API, access control, synchronization, and a minimum viable HTTP-based interface compatible with W3C DIDs and VCs. That work is underway now, and it's moving forward fast. So we talked about decentralized identity, but who's who in decentralized identity? Let's try and zoom in and, and position DIFF and position the hospitality travel thing and, and, and understand who's playing in this space. Um, we've mentioned W3C and DIFF, but there are other others. And it's a large community, in fact, and much of it is open source, coordinated under the Linux Foundation. And here are some, some of the consortium players. Uh, the Hospitality and Travel SIG, HNT SIG, is organized under DIFF. But in fact, there is a considerable ebb and flow of the same companies and people across all of these organizations. In fact, it's a large community, a uh, very large, containing perhaps a thousand, maybe 1200 odd companies uh, engaged in the effort, maybe more. And these are companies who for the most part, are, are, well, they're all working on foundational technology and very few of them will have had any exposure to hospitality and travel so far. Now the community is large, but its supporters are larger still. Many governments and agencies of government worldwide are actively supporting the development of decentralized identity technologies, very often through direct monetary funding of early stage tech development. Now, why are they doing this? Because they understand the enabling power of digital identity and want to ensure that the benefits flow to their citizens and businesses. And I want to call out three different projects out of 30 at least that are currently underway worldwide. Number one is an EU-wide digital ID for 450 million EU citizens based on decentralized digital ID technology and it enabling SSI. And this is something that was announced at the beginning of June. It's underway. It's a project over many years, but it will result in each uh, European citizen having a uh, decentralized digital ID. The second one is from the United States. This is a, a DDID research project sponsored by the Department of Homeland Security to develop an alternative and maybe a replacement for the uh, trusted and venerable uh, social security number that is so widely used in the US. And very interesting commercial, thirdly, a very interesting commercial DDID project, which is sponsored by the German government across a number of sectors the very first use case being hotel check-in for guests under corporate contract. Uh, now, we have discussed this use case and, and with participants of, of this project uh, on the HTT SIG before. Um, this use case is now live in Germany with 120 participating hotels. And hotel check-in for corporate customers is just the first opportunity, just the first use case. There will be many that will uh, adds to the richness of this project. And quickly, two centralized digital ID projects making their way to market. Centralized, not decentralized. One from finance and one from travel. So why are these interested? Why are we interested and why are we talking about these? Well, because both of these companies, Amadeus with its Traveler ID product and MasterCard, have obviously identified digital identity as a commercial opportunity. And both have also publicly stated their interest to follow, possibly to migrate to decentralized digital ID technologies when practical and available. Now let's look at DIFF, the organization under which the Hospitality and Travel SIG is formed. Uh, DIFF does three things. It engages in the development of technical specifications. So groups in DIFF develop specifications and emerging standards for protocols, components, data formats that implementers can execute against. But DIFF doesn't just stop there. It produces reference implementations or its members produce reference implementations beyond specifications to develop open source reference implementations of the technical components and the protocols that are specified. 
And lastly, DIF engages in industry coordination. Uh, and it's effectively the leading decentralized identity organization in the identity space. And these three things in one place is the reason for the HT SIG uh, organized under DIF. So who is the HT SIG? Well, we are a special uh, interest group under DIF and we created to advance the adoption of self-sovereign identity and decentralized digital identity technologies across hospitality and travel. And we were born out of a, an effort by a small group of uh, H&T technology folks to imagine uh, a technology infrastructure for hospitality and travel that is free of uh, this kind of mental and technical constraints of the past and one that uh, embraces uh, future technologies and provides capabilities to address importantly two of the fundamental challenges that those in our industries grapple with every day and we've become so accustomed to we don't really think about it which is how best to merchandise our products to our customer and who is the customer um, we currently have about 30 to 35 participating companies most of the participants from those companies are travel providers cios or cto's travel tech supplier ceos perhaps and and consultants um, so it's generally a, a fairly high, high uh, caliber participation and we can get things done. So why the SIG and why now? That's what it is. Why, why now? Because this is an important point, because decentralized digital ID technologies are, in our view, a once in a generation disruptive, a once in a generation disruptive technologies. And we want to get in at the early stage rather than just wait until products emerge that may not meet our needs. And the obvious commercial opportunity uh, is to be first to market. But for some, it's simply because self-sovereignty over uh, digital identity is the right thing to work on. And lastly, note the timeframes here for similar generational leaps to take hold. And let's just examine these here. TCPIP, 1974, to uh, 1982, roughly. Um, moving on a decade, HTTP in the browser, 89 to 97. GSM and mobile, 93 to 2007, so longer. And I believe of equal importance, we believe of equal importance, uh, decentralized digital ID, which enables decentralization, which enables point of peer-to-peer -peer interactions, which we will discuss in a minute. Um, let's give it 2018 to 2030, so you see where we are. It may arrive more quickly, earlier, it may not. But even if it did take 12, 12 years, it wouldn't be out of context with these three other really pivotal foundational technologies, which, um, of note, all of these efforts were enabled by community developments, all of them, including TCP and IP. And that was open source bef before open source existed. So what are we doing? Uh, we're engaged um, on use case development currently. We have completed two use cases so far with more in the works. And we're organizing this work from four teams targeted at specific subjects so if you have any interest, please download our cases from the h and uh, SIG site. And I think Doug will probably put the link uh, in the uh, chat as we speak. Um, the four teams are verifiable credentials and offers, travel change and disruption, know your customer profile and loyalty, and government sanctions credentials. Um, I won't go into great detail about what each of these teams does. That is the subject of follow-on webinars from here. If you do care to, and I hope you do, um, download and read the first two uh, use cases, which are from the VCNO team and the travel and the uh, KYC profile and loyalty teams, uh, you'll get a very clear understanding of what they're doing. These are fairly detailed cases. They represent, uh, a, they describe a very, very interesting future. So I encourage you to download those, um, those uh, use cases if you can. But we're not stopping there. There will be more use cases and more use case teams, I'm sure. Um, one of the things that, that we're doing uh, with the government sanctioned uh, credentials team uh, is we have done 
an endorsement of uh, the Good Health Pass, a collaborative interoperability bl blueprint for interoperable health travel passes. We've made recommendations uh, and we hope that we will be working with GHPC under TOIP, tr uh, Trust Over IP, to extend um, hospitality and travel sector coverage beyond international air travel. Now, if anybody is interested in this effort, please do contact me because we're looking for participants. So that's what we're doing now. Up next, we're going to be working on profile, um, including sharing and how it's shared and profile schemas. We're going to be working on payment. We're going to be looking at transactions and how they can best be represented uh, contractually. Um, offers an organizational identity. These are just some of the things that we, we're doing up next. So there's quite a rich um, uh, board of opportunities here. Now, that was the why, the what. Now, what about the why? Uh, the important part. <laughs> Benefits for travel providers. I've organized these into four parts. Um, customer data, product shopping and offers, customer communication and finance and, and admin. And let's just start with customer data. Um, Self-sovereign identity and decentralized digital identity allows customer data um, to be organized uh, such that travel providers can receive current, accurate and permission data with each reservation. So every time a reservation is made, you receive exactly the information that the sending party wants you to have about them. And it simplifies and can simplify directly reduce regulatory compliance in GDPR and CCPA. Because if I've sent you my profile with a reservation, and I said you can use it. I have automatically given you permission for everything that I have sent you. And it will reduce the need to, or eliminate even the need to store identity and passport details because I'm giving it to you every single time. You don't need to store it for my reuse. And it will, we believe, eliminate the need to store sensitive credit card details, which is a real pain uh, for, uh, for our industries. And that it will also allow, we hope, we hope, and this is an area of future work and investigation, but it will allow us to access customer data even for reservations that arrive through indirect channels, online travel agents. Let's talk about uh, product shopping and offers just quickly. Um, consumers can search the universe of travel without being forced to use an OTA. They can receive personalized rate code quotes based on product requirements that they they provide i want a hotel with a gym i want a hotel with a high floor i want vegetarian meals based on my preferences but also other attributes such as my memberships that i might have age affiliations i'm a, a member of the hilton team hilton uh, loyalty program uh, i'm now uh, shopping in a uh, hyatt and uh, you should recognize that I'm high tier in Hilton and give me some benefits for that recognition. Customer communication is a very important one. We often com complain in hospitality and travel about not being able to communicate with the customer prior to arrival. This is a real big issue. Uh, here we have permissioned peer-to-peer -peer open messaging channel to customer and I'll explain that graphically in a minute. And lastly, behind the scenes, um, in finance and admin, easy reconciliation of post-day data with reservations across all entities. And this will simplify refunds, corporate account measurement, commissions, expense reporting, uh, et cetera. So there's quite a, a significant 360 degrees of benefits for travel providers here. And we're only beginning to scratch the surface at the moment. So where to start? Um, DDIT, <coughs> uh, fortunately, um, Decentralized digital ID tech does not replace uh, existing travel provider tech. It's additive and can be added to the typical travel tech stack, at least for uh, proof of concept evaluation. If I was going to choose a target application for um, POC evaluation, I would want to position identity wallets uh, as the other channel to market alongside 
the familiar direct and indirect channels that we use today. And I would further target this new capability towards my best customers. We have now created a peer-to-peer -peer commercial interaction between the travel provider and the customer where identity of both parties is known and the rich information behind these identities is available at a granular level and with permission, and it can be trusted. The two integrations necessary to make this interaction work are, firstly, integrate the travel provider identity hub into existing systems. Secondly, integrate the travel provider mobile app, the typical hotel or airline mobile app, with the customer identity wallet to allow the rich information stored in the identity hub of the customer to flow to the travel provider and be useful. And one point to make clear, um, I started this webinar suggesting that the powerful intermediary model that is so defining in hospitality and travel and which obscures the customer and makes supplier customer communication very difficult. Well, here we have a direct um, peer to peer supplier customer relationship. There is no intermediary present. So how should we communicate with that customer? Should we send continue to send emails? Should we talk over Facebook Messenger? Well, no, um, we don't need to because a direct messaging a capability is possible identity hub to identity hub and you think well how can that be well it's very simple because the message is just data it doesn't matter what type of message it is it's just data and that's what identity hubs store and lastly <laughs> there is still a potential role for intermediaries in the p2p commerce world at least in the short medium term here the intermediary takes on the role of an identity service relay. But very importantly, the identity service relay does not need to provide, own, or store any information about the customer. The uh, ID service acts as a relay between two parties, enabling peer-to-peer -peer commerce for travel providers who may ne not yet be ready to directly integrate decentralized digital ID technologies into their existing technology stacks to engage in peer-to-peer -peer commerce. At least this is how we think it might turn out. And again, uh, this is work in progress. So a quick summary, and I'll leave you with some questions. We have seen that decentralized digital ID technologies enable peer-to-peer -peer commerce. And I have suggested that our best customers might be the best place to start with this new model for commerce. And I have shown the direct continuous communication, something that previously was so difficult, is now possible. So if you could talk unconstrained to your most loyal customers, well, what would you say? Would you sell them the same product, one that is largely defined by the third party channels through which it is sold? And no doubt there will be some debate on this but I think I'll give you some examples of what I'm talking about in a minute. Or would you innovate to construct new products better suited to the target market? One that you can reach through now a different channel. Oh. So a flight, a taxi, a meeting room at a local hotel a hotel room by the minute, choose your hotel room. These are different products. Familiar, yes, but they're not products that we could sell through third party channels today because these products are a different size and shape. They don't fit on the store shelves that OTAs provide. Now, I give these as simple examples, right? By no means am I necessarily promoting these things. But to be clear, none of these products exist today and they may never exist unless we choose to build them. But it depends on unconstrained thinking and the availability of new technologies. And all of these, uh, all of these products require different thinking and different technologies in order to be able to merchandise them, to offer them for sale. And one, and probably the most important, is decentralized digital identity that enables peer-to-peer -peer digital commerce. And with that, I'd like to say thank you.
Uh, this is the end of our first webinar. I hope it will not be the last. Uh, we are planning at least two more that will uh, explore in depth some of our use cases and how they enable new opportunities for hospitality and travel. Um, the second and third second webinar will take place uh, at the same time on Wednesday, September the 1st. That's 11 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. So please do make a note in your diary. And again, thank you very much for attending this web webinar. And that's uh, me signing off and goodbye for now. Over to you, Doug. Or I guess anybody, we, we have some, some time if we have any questions. Great. Right. Got about 20 minutes. So you can either raise your hand or post in the chat or just speak out if you have questions. I'll go for it. <laughs> Hi. Um, attributes. I know I've sort of dropped a couple of sort of thoughts in the chat um, over the over the weeks, etc. And um, stuff like inclusion, obviously from an economic perspective, i.e. if you appeal to more people, your demand goes up and hopefully your, your yield in price goes up. So um, and I, I, it's a sort of sensitive subject in terms of inclusion, accessibility, what sort of stuff. To what and I we sort of talked a little bit about sort of um, representation on this working group. So I guess are we comfortable? I guess that we've got representation and inclusion a within the working group, and I guess b in terms of the outputs, in terms of taking it out to the wider wider um, ecosystem, um, particularly around accessibility and inclusion, not only from a physical accessibility perspective, but obviously across the whole DNI space as well. Um, just some commentary around that. I think perhaps would be uh, just useful. Well, simply to say that uh, our participation in the hospitality and travel SIG is open to all. There is no membership required. There is no payment required. There is no sign up required. There is just simply interest and participation, contribution. So uh, everything that is produced by the hospitality and travel SIG, everything that's produced by, by a DIF is available uh, in the public domain. It is available uh, under uh, open source licensing it is available anybody can pick it up even if you haven't participated in uh the in the development of of, of these specifications and and core technologies so it's difficult to uh mm. to to uh, answer is it open enough it's we may not have done a, gr a good enough job of publicizing it and certainly i can think of some of the communities that you reference that may not be participants currently that is probably simply because we do not have access to those communities. If you do, then please invite them to participate. They will find an open door. Yep. Okay. Excellent. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Colin. Uh, Nick, I had a question about a, a detail on uh, one of the slides, mm -hmm. uh, uh, kind of in the first third of the presentation. Uh, yep. It was a slide where you had uh, uh, hotel uh, or hospitality and travel suppliers uh, uh, on both the left and the right side and uh, 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 charts depicting the interaction of the uh, uh, of the dids uh, between them. And I'm, I'm wondering if it would be helpful to the audience if we broke down the nomenclature of the did identifiers under each of the uh, travel suppliers on that slide where uh, uh, in fine print you had did S and a long number or did ion oh, and a long I number see, okay. um, so that people can understand uh, yeah, yeah, uh, see. what role the, that identifier plays. Oh, I'll see what I can, uh, I'll see if I can pick it up, just carry on talking. Yeah. So yeah, um, yeah I should have tried to capture the slide number or something. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Um, thank you very much. So the one, the one you're referring to is uh, what does an, uh, what is a, an identifier, a, a, a decentralized ID. Mm -hmm. And, um, if I could find my Zoom and share my screen, I would be able to tell you. <laughs> so just one second. Um, there we are. I'm now going to share a screen again. And I'm sharing that one. So hopefully you can see the screen. Yep, that's the one. 
that's the one. So um, yeah, let's just talk about identifiers, right? The most common one that we think of today being, sorry, let me just stop this. <laughs> <laughs> the most common one that we think of today being uh, an email address, all right? An email address is an identifier, but there are others, a passport number is an identifier, a social security number, so on, uh, is, is an identifier. Well, here's a different type of identifier. Uh, it's it's uh, is under each of the hotel names or, or even in the customer profile. Um, and it's a, it's a sort of universal format. So did, in this case, DID, which specifies it's a decentralized identifier, ION, which specifies a method, and then an identifier associated with that method, a unique identifier, an address, basically. So what that says is, this is a decentralized identifier. We use the method associated with, in this case, ION, but it might be Sovereign, and I'll come back to what those are in a minute, or Ethereum, to locate the decentralized ID on those chains and to retrieve from those uh, DIDs the uh, DID document, which provides service endpoints and cryptographic keys. So ION, SOV, and uh, ETH are simply names of um, decentralized identity networks. Um, Sovereign is an identity uh, network based on a blockchain that is specific to decentralized identity. Ethereum, I think you probably know about more, more general purpose, but um, there's identity, uh, identity, uh, decentralized identity on, on Ethereum. Um, and uh, ION is a, a layer two network, identity network um, developed on a protocol called SideTree, which was developed in DIFF. Uh, it is a, a, a Microsoft uh, network, but it is open source. It's available to others, or SideTree is open source and available to others. The uh, Ethereum implementation is the thing that's referenced here. So you have SideTree on Ethereum, um, open source, um, open source layer two network protocol. So one of the things illustrated in this slide is uh, the, the idea that uh, decentralized digital identity uh, concepts are intended to be interoperable uh, from the concept stage <clears throat> uh, and uh, really to create a, an open and competitive marketplace for uh, delivering these services. Yeah, yeah, nobody owns them, right? In, in, order, in order for decentralized digital identity to work, there has to be a vibrant and massive ecosystem globally. And therefore to, it's a foundational enabling technology. It's like IP. If IP had been closely, closely managed and held within certain organizations and license fees associated with it and royalties, it would never have taken off. We would never have used it. We'd be using, who knows, you know, IPX networks or something like that now. So, yeah, um, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> so, um, yeah, this is, this is why this is important. We're at that one of those really pivotal moments here where, Hopefully, in ten years' time, uh, these uh, these identifiers will be more common uh, than your social security number, and they will be more common than your uh, passport number or your email address, because they will have replaced them. And I think there's an analogy here that uh, that may be useful to some people, which is you, know, you look at that those those did um, representations on this slide. It's really no different than a URL for a website. Uh, it, it's it's used exactly the same way, uh, except for the fact that you, it does support different variations of the resolution um, you know, for for the different chains. But just like a website points you to uh, a particular server that will give you, um, you know, HTML code back when you make a call, this will give you an identity uh, back when you make a call. Yeah, that's exactly right, Doug. And it's the job of the universal resolver to receive the request for the identity resolution to find out which chain it is. So it's the universal resolver is taking this address and it's saying this, I might be asked to resolve a decentralized ID. I can find that ID on an iron network. I use the method associated 
with the ION network to, I, to resolve uh, 11345 A, B, C, D, E, F, whatever. And of course, that's a very simplified, uh, not a real ID, but you get the idea. Hey, Nick, uh, Josh Dow from Wyndham here. Uh, okay. Great. Great to see the evolution in the in the deck here. Uh, you know, it's it's only been a couple of weeks, and definitely some new content to absorb. It, it, as you um, you know, envision this kind of through the architecture phases into eventual implementation. Any thoughts around how the DID world will interact with the rest of the kind of blockchain ecosystem? Like, I, you know, to me, the the opportunities here are really coupled closely with payment. Uh, do you envision the hub being able to manage? kind of cross-chain interoperability so that we could execute a smart contract and have that reconciled against an Ethereum address for payment? Or or is that kind of somebody else's role outside the tick, domain of... Tick, of tick, tick. Done, please, huh? George, okay. please come and participate in the hospitality and travel stick. That's exactly what we're talking about. Sounds like a POC to me, Nick. Yeah, yeah that's exactly <laughs> what we're talking about josh um thank you very much for for mentioning it that that all of the things that you just discussed <laughs> will be described in our in our use case uh are described in our two use cases that we have now and uh will be discussed in the next uh, the next webinar and there's a lot of discussion going on within diff right now as well about how to get interoperability on smart contracts across chains because right now that doesn't exist but it's recognized as, as a need so it's a watch this space area and we're we're assuming it will get solved we don't know how yet yeah very good i'll certainly be watching the space i promise very good thank you yeah just one one sort of cautionary note a little bit um working with early stage core tech is a kind of unfamiliar thing for those of us in hospitality and travel um, because we're used to working with technology that's just gone through its first v1 release cycle that technology is if it's based on new tech, it's probably sort of been five years in the lab before it's before it's uh, it's out there on the street in V1. And here we're working in the prior to lab. We're working in the at the early stage called um, the early stage uh, technology development in specification and POCs. So um, yeah, there, 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 there's some time before we get to V1, but it's a great privilege because we have a huge opportunity here to influence and um, describe our need. And I would humbly suggest there is probably no other industry that is better positioned to make real use of these technologies because we're in such specific need. Any other questions before we, uh, before we sign off? One question regarding uh, next week's um, session, Nick. Um, you mentioned we're going to explore more deeply the, the four use cases we've mm -hmm. built over the last several months. Um, I would say that could be a very logical follow-up to everyone here. But to those of you in your networks, um, it would also be a good recruitment opportunity if you have API economy partnerships already in place to bring some of those people here. So it's a bit of a public service announcement for our, our SIG here. Um, but the more the merrier on these sessions, because I think yeah. that'll help unearth a lot of potential project relationships that we hope to encourage. Yeah. Are you referring to uh, webinar two? Jim? Yes. Uh, webinar two. Yeah. yeah so September one. Two, September, uh, September one. one. And, I, and I, 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 I know I misstated the date. September one. Yes. And, and for the benefit of those who want to share this session is recorded. Um, the the uh, link will be sent out sometime probably later today to the mailing list. If you're not on the mailing list, um, you can use the link I posted in the in the chat uh, to sign up to get instructions on how to get on the mailing list. Um, or if you need to, you can reach out to to one of us for um, guidance on the on the link to the this webinar. We just need to wait for Zoom to compile it. Can I, um, I think maybe we can just call out some new participants. I, I, Alex is here. Alex Bainbridge is new on the, uh, on the call. I don't know if he wants to say hello. Um, who else is new here? 
that we haven't seen before. Ian, Ian, have you been here in Waters before? Yeah. Hi, so. hi, Nick. Hi, Nick. Ian, Ian here from Congatus. Um, you probably know my colleague Gillian. Uh, Indeed. Gillian Jones. So um, <laughs> I, um, so I'm also from Congatus. I, I normally spend my side on the dark side in the um, the FSI um, SIG uh, for in the diff group. So I'm. I thought I'd come along today because you, you indeed, you came and presented to us a few weeks back. Indeed. I did. I did. Yes, I did. And um, we'd be, we'd be delighted to have uh, a more uh, effective interaction with the uh, finance, banking and finance folks on their SIG. Um, I've been talking with, uh, with Paul. Um, I'm hopeful we can get something a 